Hey guys, welcome to Living Seeds Farm. Thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. Today we are talking about when the grid is down. What is going to happen? And the purpose of this talk, and I mentioned it earlier, my biggest fear is that I install fear in you. And that is the last thing I want to do. I'm not looking to install fear in you. I'm looking to get your minds thinking about how to solve problems. I can't solve all of your problems. Every single person has a unique problem. But the takeaway from today is that I'm not trying to scare you. This is not a fear-mongering session. This is a session to make you think about how to resolve problems in your life. Every single person is different. We had a young lady over here called Vicky earlier. Um, three months without water. It's ludicrous. And I, I, I hope that you guys have actually spoken to her and, and found out how she resolved some of her issues. Um, because I'd like to have a chat to her as well. Okay, so we are going to be discussing scenarios here. And the, the idea is that you are taking notes on the scenarios that affect you and the issues that affect you in those scenarios. If you haven't brought pen and paper, please take notes on your cell phone. Okay, it's, it's a case of, um, I, I really, and I'm emphasizing it again, I really don't want you to use this to inst instill fear in yourself. Okay, because this is actually quite a serious subject. It really, really is. Okay, so we've all, we've all heard the media talking about elevated stages of load shedding. We've all heard them talking about stage 8 and stage 11 and stage 16, etc. Okay, what's happening is that the goalposts, our goalposts, have been moved. And to give you an illustration of how forgetful you are, okay, and the reason why I say how forgetful you are is because I did the research, so now I remember. In 2007, that was when we first experienced load shedding. If you all remember, it was stage one, two, three, and four. How long were this? How long were the load shedding stages? Does anybody remember? This is actually very important. Does anybody remember how long one of those load shedding stages was? It was four hours. In 2007, load shedding was a four hour block of time. 2015, and I'm, I might be slightly out on this date, but in 2015, it went to stage six. So now we had stages one to stage six. It was still a four hour block. Does anybody remember that? Hey, you don't, you don't. 2019, it went from stage one to stage eight, and they changed the blocks to two and a half hours. So now the equivalent block is five hours. They added on 20% without us even noticing. Sure, everybody's quiet. <laughs> hey? So now we've got two blocks. It's, 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 all, well, it's not two blocks, the blocks are two and a half hours. But the equivalent time down is a five hour block and not a four hour block. This year, they're talking about stage what? Stage 11, they're talking stage 16. Okay, can you see that the goalposts are continuously being moved? They're talking about stage 16. Who's heard of someone talk about stage 20? Has Isn't that when they break into your house and blow up the candles? Correct, yes. So the scary thing is stage six currently, is 11 and a half hours of load shedding. The amazing thing is if you, if you look at your stages, there's multiple times during the week where one stage, or th sorry, where three stages have the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Where stage three and stage six are the exact same time. But they say we're on stage three. 
Yeah. But stage six is the exact same stage, uh, exact same. So the goalposts are continually, are continually being moved. And it's only going to get worse. So we've, we've seen a number of instances in the media where people are talking about stage 20 load shedding. Okay, and I'm not 100% sure, but my understanding is that stage 20 load shedding, they are going to be islanding the power stations. So the power stations will power the power stations and nothing else to prevent a national blackout. That is my understanding. I actually, it's, I, I could be incorrect. The industry ex experts, multiple industry experts, and you can go and, if you go onto News24, onto Business Tech, onto my broadband, onto, on, onto any news platform, multiple experts are saying we will see stage 11 this winter. The, the, the new Minister of Energy is saying no, stage 6. We're not going to go over stage 6 this winter. So they're contradicting each other. Then you look at international governments. America has warned about a national grid collapse in South Africa. The EU has warned about a national grid collapse in South Africa. The UK has warned about a national grid collapse in South Africa. The government is saying it's never going to happen. Even Nick is prepared. For a, a Even Netcare is preparing. Everyone's preparing. Why are we preparing? If it's not exactly okay, so multiple large um, corporates and industries are preparing for a national grid collapse. If they are preparing for a national grid collapse and the government is saying it's not going to happen, why are you guys here today? Cool. So. The situation is going to get worse. And the question is, what is going to happen when the grid goes down? So we spoke a little bit about it earlier in the first talk. The first thing that's going to happen is we're going to lose water. Well, we're going to lose electricity, but the grid is down. So we haven't lost it. It's gone. Okay. The water will fail. As we discussed earlier, all of the water is electrically pumped. Craig mentioned earlier, all of our sewerage, especially in low-lying areas, is electrically pumped out of the low-lying area. If those pumps fail and you live in a low-lying area, you're going to have a fun time. Okay. The most important thing for you guys to do is water filtration. You need to find a way to filter water. Go and talk to Craig. Craig has got solutions. Um, if you've got a Berkey or a Stephanie water filter, that's what you're looking for. If you can't afford a Berkey or a Stephanie water filter, buy the Berkey filter cartridges and don't buy one cartridge, buy multiple cartridges because you're going to be filtering a lot of very dirty water and those cartridges are going to fill up like this. Okay? Um, and learn how to make a, a jerry-rigged um, Berkey filter using plastic buckets. There are plans on the internet for that. Water storage. So you can store water in two liter bottles. You can store water in your bath. You can store water in your swimming pool. You can drink your swimming pool water as long as it's gone through a filter. Filter it, boil it. Whatever you do, do not drink water that hasn't been filtered. If you drink water that hasn't been filtered, you are going to need medical support. Of, uh, it's, yeah. You're going to need medical support. And that medical support, if you, if you get dehydrated and need to go to a hospital, probably the hospital is not going to accept you because you are not um, at the level of, 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 of intensive care that they are prepared to assist you if they have diesel to run their generators. And that's another question that we need to actually um, talk about. The next thing is, how many of you have got solar? Inverter, battery backup? When the power goes off, how many of you leave your lights on? Why? Because you have all the neighbors fine. Sorry? All the neighbors were fine. All the neighbors? Fine. All the neighbors phone. And what are they phoning about? No, they want to come over. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the lady says her lights are on and all of her neighbors phone because they want to come over because they need a bath, a charge, uh, whatever. The problem is if the grid goes down and you are the only person with lights, you are the person advertising to every single person around you, I've got stuff. And the stuff that you've got, they want. 
They want your panels, they want your battery, they want your inverter. You've got a fridge with frozen food or cold food. Okay, so it's, it's, it's one of the things, we've got solar over here. When we have load shedding here, um, I, I think our longest incidence of load shedding was 28 hours, hey love? Yeah. A couple of weeks back, two weeks, two or three weeks back, 28 hours. Okay, we were fine. But we turned our lights off. Because we don't want to be telling our, cus our, our customers, sorry guys, we don't, want to be t we don't want to be telling our neighbors, I'm all right, Jack. Yeah. They know we've got solar. You've got to be blind not to realize it. We've got a hatchery with a big red light on at night. So everybody knows that we have solar. We just don't advertise it. And it's critically important. So it's a case of, we can see Germiston. If you look out here, you can see Germiston. It's 30, 30, 35 k's away. If we can see Germiston, they can see us. Okay, those guys up on the hill over there, a couple of those guys have got lights burning. They are going to call the guys from Germiston and they're going to come through our place. To... Okay, so you don't want to attract the wrong kind of people. And the wrong kind of people can be your neighbors. We know some of our neighbors are distasteful people. Okay. You want to reduce and eliminate your light signature. Your light signature, it's, it's a case of when we do patrols outside at night, we can see a guy smoking a cigarette in the trees, which is it's one and a half k's away. We can see the guy smoking a cigarette or he's smoking a joint in the trees, whatever. You know, Dutch courage. Okay, so it's a case of your lights, your lights are a problem. And it's very important if you're a person with with um, with solar now, get into the habit now of reducing your light signature. Because if the grid goes down, you won't know the grid go, has gone down because you're cool. I've got power, I've got lights, I'm watching TV. The TV might go down, you might not realize it. When you walk outside, it's black outside. And everyone's gonna go, mm, I want to go visit there. A generator is exactly the same problem, but it comes with additional issues. So the generator masks the sound of people approaching your property. They can make a lot of noise climbing over gates, climbing through fences, climbing under fences, cutting fences, cutting locks. The neighbor's dogs can be barking, and you won't hear the neighbor's dogs barking because your generator is drowning out that sound. Dennis, can you hear our generator when it runs? Cool, I'm glad. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> but it's, an, it's important. So Dennis is one of our neighbors, okay? And it's a case of, um, it's very important to know what your neighbors are doing, whether you like them or not. I'm not gonna say if I like you or not, Dennis. <laughs> okay. Travel is going to be a very bad idea. If the grid goes down, you probably will be free to travel for the first probably 72 hours because nobody has lost their minds yet. And it takes 72 hours, it takes literally people to lose three meals in a row before people lose their sense of humor and their sense of morality. When that happens, traveling is going to be a very bad idea. So there's, it, it's entirely possible that if the grid goes down for an extended period of time, you will not be traveling after 72 hours. I would highly recommend that you don't travel after 72 hours, which means you, you have 72 hours to get to where you need to be. That's if it doesn't go down exceptionally badly in a very short time. There's going to be riots. Look at what happened in, in Durban. Look at what happened in, in, in Joburg during the riots. Okay, it, it wasn't pretty. Roadblocks. So the roadblocks will either be police or army, and we all know that they're very trustworthy. All the roadblocks can be people that are looking to take your stuff. I would strongly suggest that you ignore the rules of the road if you have to travel. Okay, that's um, ignoring or abiding by the rules when someone steps out of the road and stops you 
in a grid down scenario is a very, very bad idea. Just ignore it. Keep going. Doesn't matter what uniform they're wearing. And this is going on YouTube. <laughs> so the food supply is going to fail. And I'm going to be talking about the food supply in a, in a couple of separate instances for you to understand how, how tired our society is to the magic shelf in your supermarket. So the food supply is going to fail spectacularly. There will be no shops. They're probably going to be looted. If they are not looted, they are going to be closed. If I am the, if I am the store manager of a shop and there's a group of people outside with, 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 with bricks and, and sharp objects, I will, I will open the back door of the shop and I'll walk out. Okay? And it's a case of um, the shop is insured. Let the insurance company sort it out when... When, when order is restored. Okay, so there's going to be no food production. How many of you have bought frozen vegetable in the last month? How many of you? So keep your hands up. Or well, actually, everybody put your hands up. If you haven't, if you have, if you have not bought one of these, okay, you can put your hands down. Frozen vegetables, canned vegetables, fresh vegetables. Who has not bought all three? Have you not bought any fresh vegetables? No frozen, no canned? Well done, I'm coming to your place. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the Joburg market is gonna collapse. All of the fresh vegetable that you bought, okay, either went through the, the Johannesburg fresh produce market or one of the fresh food distribution companies like fresh to go for Woolworths or um, food, food Lovers Market, etc. That is going to collapse. It's going to stop. There will be no deliveries of fresh, of fresh produce. Who's been to the Joburg Fresh Produce Market? Have you seen how many trucks go in and out of that market on a daily basis? It is absolutely unbelievable. The whole back of the Johannesburg market is cold storage. That's where they store all the bananas and the apples and stuff like that for, for six months. And then artificially ripen them so that you can buy ripe bananas every day of the week. That is all going to collapse. That, that cold storage is toast. Cool. So, um, our agriculture is based on processing. The majority of the food that you buy has been processed. Yeah, but I buy fresh carrots. Those fresh carrots were processed. They came out of the ground, they went through a machine, they were cleaned by a machine, they were packed by a machine. It's processed. Yes, it's fresh carrots, but it's processed. The chicken, the fresh chicken that you bought at, at Pick and Pay, that chicken was processed. It was, it was raised in a, in a concentration camp chicken house? Uh, well, it actually is, okay? But it was raised in a concentration camp chicken house. That house is heated with electricity, or it's heated with coal, but generally it's heated with electricity. It's transported to an abattoir where it's processed using electricity. Um, it's cut up using machines and chilled. Um, using electricity. The, the entire process requires electricity. I'll tell you the chicken story now, which is, which, which is actually quite an um, enlightening story. So everything that we're buying on a daily basis from the store is processed. The bread that you buy is, store, is, is processed. That entire infrastructure will be gone like this. So if you don't have a solution for, for every single aspect of that, you are going to have a problem, which is why the first talk that I spoke to you about was, 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 so, inter was, was so important. Um, the cold chain will, will be eliminated because the cold chain requires electricity. The entire cold chain is toast. Milk, cheese, um, refrigerated, refrigerated anything, it's gone. This is how, how tied in to electricity we are and, um, and, and processed everything because that magic shelf is processed. It doesn't matter what it is, you buy off that shelf, it's processed. Your cucumber came in a plastic sleeve, it was processed using electricity. 
medical. So we spoke about medical earlier, and I think medical is probably, it's, it's one of those aspects that you guys need to start making plans on. If you're on chronic medication, look at getting two or three, at least two or three months of chronic medication on hand. Talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist. This is what you're concerned about. I promise you they're concerned about the same thing, they just don't want to talk about it. Okay, and if you've got the right doctor, the right doctor will help you make a plan. If you know a pharmacist, a pharmacist will help you make the plan as well. So chronic medication, your medical aid is not gonna help you for three months. I think the only way that you can get a three month supply of medicine is if you're saying you're going overseas for three months and they'll give you three months advance, but then you do the three months, oh no, I canceled my trip, can I have my, they're gonna go, mm -mm. <laughs> Diabetes, um, dialysis, Everything that is, is it requires electricity and, and you need it for, for life support is going to be an issue. Okay, and then we spoke about um, the guys on antidepressants. 60% of the people in the queue are on antidepressants. Okay, so the things that I haven't spoken about, and I, I, I haven't covered, and the reason why I haven't covered them is that... Um, can go downhill very quickly when we start talking about these things, and I'm not a subject, a, a, a matter expert on a lot of this stuff. So security and protection, firearms, some way to protect yourselves, okay? I'm not an expert. There are other people that are far more qualified than myself. Things that are going to collapse are the emergency services. Fire brigade, it's not going to happen. Police, not going to happen. Um, ambulances, hospitals, not going to happen. They've all got their own families that they're worried about. Your issue, they're not worried about it. It's your issue. Okay? The cops are more concerned about looking after their own family. They also have families. They have wives. They have children. Same with the medical services, the, the ambulances. They have wives. They have families. They've got to look after them as well. Municipal services, non-existent. Some of you live in, in, in towns and cities where the municipal services are already non-existent, so you're not going to actually feel it. We laugh, but it's, it's, it's serious. Communications. Who's got a landline? One person has a landline. Okay. Well, this is it, yes. So we used to have phone lines over here. And what happened was they came at night and they stole the phone lines. They took the copper. They sold the copper to China. China took the copper, turned it into a cell phone, and gave us back our phones. <laughs> so communications are going to be gone. Your cell phone's not going to work. I talked to uh, a cellular expert a couple of weeks back, um, and he reckons he, 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 he is, his job is installing cellular networks. That is his job. And he said he would be surprised if the cell phone network lasted more than six hours. Okay, he would be surprised. So, what communications do you have? To have a chat to Craig, he's a communications expert. Craig's an expert in a lot of things, actually. Okay, so those are the things that I haven't covered, but those are the things that you actually need to be thinking about. Cool, so, the next thing is, I mean, that's all the bad news. And we can carry on talking about the bad news. And I don't really want to talk about the bad news. But I'm going to talk about the even worse news. <laughs> the grid comes back. So how can that be even worse news? <laughs> so our government says to us, if there is a national grid failure, it'll be down for two weeks. Okay. The industry experts are saying two to six weeks, best estimates. Now, those of you that experience extended load shedding, or those of you that have experienced load shedding and they've stolen cables, who's stolen cables to your house or suburb while you had load shedding? Do you think they're going to steal cables when the grid is down? Has anybody thought about that? So the power comes back, but you're missing a cable, so you're not going to get power anyway. 
and I promise you, you won't be the only person where the cables have been stolen. So the power might come back on, but your area might not come back on, which is actually, I don't think anybody's actually thought about that. Yes, sir. Sorry, Paul, just to add on that, I personally have been through this for eight days. Yeah. Uh, it's not only if the power goes before it comes back on, but when it comes back on, your mini substations can have a problem because it's going to explode if it doesn't do maintenance. Correct. And we were without power for eight days because of that. Correct. So um, he's talking about an inductive um, a, a drawdown on the on the grid, and I'll talk about that now. But what happens is when the power comes back on, the inductive um, voltage spike or, or amperage spike is so high that it causes additional issues. Okay, so we've spoken about the food supply. The thing is, the food supply needs to be restarted. So let me tell you about the chicken story. So we have a chicken hatchery over here. It's not the biggest chicken hatchery out there, but it's the largest heritage chicken hatchery. There are industrial scale chicken hatcheries that hatch two, three million chickens a day for the, um, for, for the chicken market. Who's eaten chicken more than once a week? More than twice a week? More than three times a week? <laughs> Our hands are up. We have lots of chicken. Okay, so it takes 21 days to go from an egg to a day-old chick. It takes seven weeks to go from a day-old chick to a chicken that has been slaughtered and is ready to eat. 21 days plus seven weeks is? 10 weeks. It's two and a half months. <coughs> It'll take two and a half months after the grid comes back to start getting chickens into the market. And the reason why is that the chicken hatcheries aren't going to be hatching chickens while the grid is down. Even if they've got generators, the farms will not take the chickens because they haven't got electricity to keep the chickens warm. Even if they do have electricity to keep the chickens warm, the companies that produce the feed to feed the chickens are not going to be able to produce the feed. And even if the companies that produce the feed can produce the feed, it's got to be transported to the chicken farms. Can you see where all of these issues are coming? It's not just a case of, oh, it's a chicken farm, let's grow chickens. There's a whole process behind it. There's a whole value chain behind the chicken that you buy off the pick and pay shelf. Two and a half months before you get the first chickens. And I promise you, they will not produce enough chicken to feed the entire country in two and a half months. It's just not possible. Because the chickens that you buy, pick and pay now, were slaughtered a week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Life is going to be exciting. Water treatment. So to treat water, to get water into that reservoir on the top of that hill over there, requires an electrical process, okay? And the, the water has to go through a, a coagulation process, a flocculation process, a sedimentation process, a filtration process, and then a disinfectant process, and then pumped to the water reservoir. If it's been stopped for, for two weeks, and let's say it's two weeks, the whole process has to be restarted again. And then you need to fill the, st uh, um, fill the storage. And the guys at the bottom of the hill that got all of the sewage are going to be using the water to clean the sewage that was left for, for two weeks ago. Okay, And that is just the water, the drinking water. We're not even talking about the, the sewage. And the thing is, those, the, those, water, those sewage treatment plants are actually living organisms. Okay, the, the sewage treatment, it's the bacteria that treats the sewage, it's a massive living organism. If, if they're not kept alive, they die. They have to be restarted from scratch again. So it's a huge issue. Absolutely huge issue. So, I mentioned in the, in the first talk that there were six national power outages in the last 20 years. Not in South Africa. Who can name one? 
Texas Rangers. Ten out of ten. Anybody else? Texas wasn't. Uh, it was a. It was. I think it was four days. Okay, it was four days caused by an ice storm. So I didn't factor any. There's a, if you go into Wikipedia and you say grid collapse, so a, a grid collapse in Wiki, it brings up a list of about 120 grid collapses. The majority of them are a couple of hours to four days. I'm looking at the national grid collapses where the electricity infrastructure collapsed entirely. So the first one was in 1999 in Brazil. They had two transmission lines. One was the backup transmission line. In case the one failed, they had a backup transmission line. The one transmission line was taken out of service, was taken out of service to be maintained. The one that was working was struck by lightning. The power, 1999, was off from March the 11th to June the 22nd. That is six weeks. Okay, 90 million people were affected. In total, to repair every single portion took 103 days. They were off for six weeks. Some people were off for 103 days. 2003, USA and Canada, they were off for two weeks. It was caused by a software bug. Okay, the software bug, there was, a, there was an issue where there was something going wrong on the line. The software said, this is not in my parameters. I'm going to ignore it. The, the system ignored it. The operators weren't notified. And it, called what's called, it caused what's called a cascading collapse. Two weeks, 55 million people. Okay, both in Canada and the... Um, and the um, it, it was called the Northwest, the Great Northwest Outage. 2005, Russia... From May the 25th to August the 3rd, 10 weeks. And it was a single transformer that blew that also caused a cascading collapse. Has anybody heard of any of these? 27, uh, 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 sorry, 2007, Australia, the entire state of Victoria was out for 10 weeks, caused by their wildfires. The most recent one is Turkey in 2022, from January the 14th to April the 27th, 14 weeks. And it was caused by an, old, by an under voltage um, error, which caused a collapse as well. And it's one of the things that they're talking about here is, is under voltage or under frequency that, that, that's going to cause the collapse. And that's probably how our network will collapse if it does. They were out for 14 weeks. Some areas were out for 104 days, one day longer than the Brazil outage. So if we take those, those six and we average them, the average outing was, uh, outage was 8.8 .8 weeks. Guys, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm like, these are the facts. Okay, so what do you guys do? You guys need to plan. Your plan is personal. You know your specific circumstances. You know the people that you need to look after. And this is what I would do if I were you. I would look and say, what do I need to survive one week? And work out what you require to survive one week. And assemble that. This is my week storage. Once you've assembled the week storage, Double it. Now you have two weeks storage. The minute that you've got two weeks storage, double it. Now you have a month storage. It's quick, guys. You don't need fillet steak to survive. Okay? You don't. You don't need fillet steak to survive. Work out what you need to survive for a week. You can break it down even further and survive for a day. Go from a day to a week, from a week to two weeks, two weeks to a month, one month, two months. Now we're playing cricket. Life becomes a lot easier when you have a plan. And if you break that plan down, it's, it's, it's just simply so much easier. 
You need to identify your greatest risks. What are your greatest risks? Is your greatest risk your mother-in-law? <laughs> Don't laugh. Some of you, the greatest risk is your mother-in-law. Okay. Some of you, your greatest risk is diabetes. Some of you, your greatest risk is water. Some of you, your greatest risk is your family arriving on your doorstep. Okay. So find out what your risks are. My risk is that all of you guys know where I live. <laughs> Sorry? So you did say you have food here for 15 people, so I don't know who's getting your food. <laughs> I'd wear Kevlar if I were you. Okay. This is a mindset game. You will get through this with the correct mindset. If you panic and you go, I attended a talk at Living Seeds and Sean, he just told me all of this bad news. You're leaving with the wrong mindset. Okay, you need to leave here with a plan. You need to leave here with the understanding that you can do something about it if it goes wrong. And you know what? In spring, pick up the phone and phone me and say, Sean, I wasted my time preparing for the, for the grid collapse. And it'll be one of the nicest phone calls that I've ever received. Seriously. I, I sincerely hope that I am wrong because I don't want to be involved in this and I don't think any of you want to be involved in it especially the people that have major issues guys that is my talk and I'm sorry it didn't end on a better note okay are there any questions yes ma'am um, just just and this is very good with and thinking, but on the sewerage aspect, yes. I've got a family of six. Yes. From a toddler to a grandfather. So all the shit goes down literally. I need to make a plan because there's no water flow. Okay. Like, so, so, so the question is, I'm just repeating it for the for the YouTube video. The lady has a family of six from a toddler to a um, septuagenarian. Yes. Okay. <laughs> He's a septuagenarian, he's 70. Septuagenarian, yes. yes, he's a septuagenarian, okay? What do you do with the shit? Yes. <laughs> Literally. Literally, okay? So, research composting toilets, okay? Research using a wash bucket instead of toilet paper. Okay, yeah. You use a face cloth to wipe, and you wash the face cloth. Um, I would, I would definitely look at at composting toilets or dry toilets. Um, so, a Dennis has a lot of experience with composting toilets. Have a chat to Dennis; he will tell you how they work. It's absolutely fantastic. There's a way to do it. You can download. It's called the Humanure Handbook. Yes. Humanure. You can download the book for free. Am I right? Off the internet. Cool. Yeah, it brings disease, it brings flowers, and a whole lot of issues. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Okay, so what do you do with your wee? What I would do with the wee is I would, I would put it into a container and put it on a compost heap. You can dilute it and put it on your plants, but you will very quickly reach a, um, a, a peak urea, peak yes. ammonia, nitrogen level inside your soil. Put into the compost heap, let the compost heap sort it out. Okay, cool. Any other questions, guys? Everyone's too scared to ask. <laughs> yes, sir. Ask. Go for it. Uh, you mentioned earlier about this, uh, uh, national grid failure. Don't advertise it for electricity. Yes. The information we are getting from the CPFs, from the uh, uh, guys who do all the security, is the absolute opposite. Because the guys are waiting for the power to go off, and then that's when they strike and break in. Okay. So, how do you balance these two? Cool. So, it's a. 
That's a very good statement. I'm advocating don't advertise you have power. The CPFs are advocating that you do have power so that they can, they can trap the guys. Am I right? So okay, so you can see and trap the guys. My personal opinion is I have a wife and five children. Okay, I'm not looking to draw anybody to my property. Okay, whether you want to catch them or not, go play your game somewhere else. Okay, I, I'm not attracting people to my property so that we can try and catch them. Okay, because what's going to happen is it's not just one set of people that are going to come to your house. They're going to come to your house time after time after time. And are you going to be able to repel them every single time? Okay, it's, and I have friends that say they are happy to leave their lights burning. They will just weed out the problems. The thing is, you can weed out the problems to a certain point. And then what's going to happen is the problems are going to weed you out. Not interested. I don't play that game. Craig, I don't know what your opinion is. So, so Craig is from the Quartermaster. He is heavily involved with AFRI Forum um, and CPFs. And it's a case of he might, dif he might differ as well. I really think it depends. Um, generally, if you've got life and fences and that sort of thing, it's harder. You're going to be visible to break in. Okay, so I would, everybody makes the decision themselves. Everybody has to make their own decision. Yeah. Lights shining outside your property on the perimeter, great. Um, generally, nowadays, we know. Nobody's too strong to have their solar running or generators. The problem is in week seven or eight, when people are running out of diesel or petrol for their generators and things like that. Now people are starting, their fridges have gone froth and that sort of thing. Then things start to change. So maybe it's time to change your plan. Yeah. Okay. And just make friends with your neighbors. Now, I'm very much involved with the Epi Forum in Alberton. You get to know your community before the nonsense happens. Start a street group, not for selling stuff and that, just to get to know your neighbors for street relevant information. Get to know them. If the book says love your neighbor, well, you've got to get to know them first. <laughs> you know, guys, it's a case of I'm giving you advice from my perspective. And it's a case of you guys have your own perspective. And I'm not saying take my, my, mine is the correct advice. My advice is literally that. Take what you need and discard what you don't. It's a case of I'm not right. I'm right in my own eyes and what I consider for my family. I do not want to put my family at risk. Okay, We have our own network that, that runs over here. It runs completely separately or completely differently. And we, d we have... We have what's called force multipliers. So force multipliers are things like night vision, like thermal, things like that, where we can see people coming long before that they can see us. But then we have wide open spaces. My, my circumstances are completely different to your circumstances. Okay, so yeah, that's a very good question. There are some people saying, leave your lights on and burn your lights. I disagree. But it's entirely up to you. It's you need to make decisions for your circumstances. Cool. Um, Craig mentioned something that I actually didn't cover. Um, when things go, start going fraught inside your fridges or your freezers, if you lose power and you know that your freezer is going to defrost in the next two or three days and you are going to lose all of that meat inside your freezer, what do you do? Bultong. You can do chicken bultong, fish bultong, beef bultong, lamb bultong, pork bultong. Everything can be turned into bultong. The only way that you can turn it into bultong, I see a young lady's going, yes. The only, the only way that you can turn it into bultong is if you have the spices on hand. If you don't know how to, buy, how to make spices, you can buy spices. There's the Crown Shop in, in, in Alberton. There's Val Catering in Vereniging. Um, or you can just look up a spice recipe. We've got a, a recipe that's 100 and something years old that's been passed down through our family. Makes the best biltong ever. No, I won't give it to you. It's a family <laughs> secret. Okay, learn how to make biltong. 
but turn that meat into biltong before it goes fraught. Something about fraught meat that you might not know. You can take meat that's rotting, that has flies that have laid maggots onto it, that the maggots are crawling through the meat, it's that bad. You can take that meat and you can cook it once. You can heat it up, cook it and eat it. And nothing will happen to you. Do it a second time and you'll die. Okay? It's a trick that they taught the Seleucids in, in, in then Rhodesia. If you read Ron Reed Daly's book called Seleucids, they actually explain the process where they had the guys that were being trained as Seleucids. They put them into the bush. I think they shot a, a buffalo and they, they, they gave everybody a meal off the buffalo and everybody was excited and spirits were high. They took the buffalo and they hung the buffalo in the tree for three days and they didn't feed the guys. And they, 72 hours. What's the difference between what you will eat and what you won't eat? 72 hours. After 72 hours, they took the carcass down, they boiled it up into a big stew, fed the guys. And it was an instructive lesson to teach them that you can eat meat that is rotting, but you can only cook it once. If you cook it the second time, you will die. Just a side note. Any other questions, guys? Yes, sir. If you're in a built up area, like let's say complex, right? I've read somewhere that it's always the built up areas where there's densely populated areas can get quite dangerous. Um, would you advise leaving that area? Like head for the hills and. Okay, so the question is and um, the gentleman lives in town in a complex. Or I don't know if you live in a complex, but, it's, but, but the question is, if you live in a built-up area in a complex, is it a good idea to pack up and what's called bug out, head for the hills? Um, if you have a place that you can go to that is pre-supplied, yes. If you have a place that you can't go to and that's not pre-supplied, don't. Just don't. Okay, um, do you bug out, don't you bug out, will there be national riots? I actually sincerely hope there won't. Okay, I, I hope that it's going to be a very, very bad camping exercise for eight weeks. Like seriously, okay. Um, will society collapse? I don't think society will collapse. Will there be issues? Uh, most definitely there's going to be issues. And the idea is to get through that period as comfortably as possible because it's not going to be comfortable and I hope that I'm speaking trash and it never happens okay it's, I, I sincerely hope that this is not going to happen um, it, does, it, it depends who you talk to as to what's going to happen when the grid goes down. Sorry, if the grid goes down, not when. It depends who you talk to, what's going to happen if the grid goes down. A lot of people say, oh, it'll only be for two weeks and it'll come back on. Other people, the research that I've done, six to eight weeks is probably what we're going to be seeing. The people that work for ESCOM and that's worked a long time, think it will take at least three months. The people that work for ESCOM, okay. So, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not denigrating what you are saying. Who, who are you talking to? People that are, 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 are desk jobbies or are they system operators? System operators that work there for many years. Sorry. If the grid goes down, minimum three months. Yeah. Guys, you need to make a plan. Should we not be grateful for even stage 21 load shedding? Because mm. it's not in the load shedding that it's keeping the grid stable. If we get six hours of electricity a day, that is what that is what's preventing the collapse. So you know, like I mean we're we going off onto onto um, onto discussions that I have no experience on. Should we be grateful for stage twenty or twenty one load shedding? Um, we should be grateful that our society holds together. We should be grateful that we are able to feed our family. We should be grateful for a lot of things that we are able to do what we're able to do. Um, love. I would say the short answer is no. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
answer to that question is probably yes. Yeah, the, the short answer is probably yes. We should be grateful for any form of electricity supplied by ESCOM because the, the grid hasn't gone down. It's not a nice subject, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Ma'am. That's a very good, it's a, so I just want to repeat that for the, um, for YouTube. So the lady said that she's been experimenting with her chickens and not feeding them layer pellets. Now layer pellets have a higher protein level to allow the chickens um, to lay more eggs. And she's experienced a, um, from seven eggs a day down, from seven eggs a day down to one egg a day without layer pellets. Um, and what do you do in that instance? Um, Nicola, you wanted to say something? Um, just a, 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 a long term, short term solution is start a worm farm. Because if you can give your ch chickens a handful of worms a day, that will give them the protein that they need. So it's upping their protein level. If they're just getting vegetables and they came from a boat, their protein level won't be high enough, which is probably why they're not playing. 100%. So the solution to that, and it's a 100% 100, 100 perfect solution, is, is start a worm farm and feed the chickens a handful of worms every single day. So we've got a number of worm farms over here. What we do is we feed our day-old chicks worms, specifically to get their gut flora um, up as fast as possible. And we have found that if we feed our day-old chicks worms, our mortality rate plummets on the day old chicks because their gut flora is up there, which is absolutely fantastic. Any other questions or observations? That was a very good one about the chickens, ma'am. Anything else, guys? Go for it. A donkey boiler. Okay, so the lady is looking for somebody that, that, that can manufacture a donkey boiler. Um, the, the older people over here know what a donkey boiler is. Um, they, they haven't used, I mean, I haven't used a donkey boiler since I was in boarding school. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, so this video is going to go on to YouTube. If somebody knows of somebody that can supply a donkey boiler, just leave it in the comments below. Cool. Anything else? Yes, sir. Just do a search for rockets, rocket stove. Geezer. Cool. So the answer, ma'am, is do a search for rocket stove geezer and you'll be able to find one. Do a search for rocket stove geezer and you'll be able to find one. Excellent. Yes, ma'am. What about those drops that you get at the, the, the camping shop for? Water purification tablets. Okay, so water purification, what about the drops that you can get? You can get drops, Craig sells the drops, you can get straws, I think Craig sells the straws as well. He sells water filters, a whole variety of water filtration systems. Go and have a chat to Craig, he'll sort you out. Excellent guys, I want to thank you very much, I want to thank you for the questions. I sincerely apologize that it wasn't as exciting as my normal talks. <laughs> guys, have a great day and please drive home safely. Thank you very much. Thank you.